When we get in our own way, it's almost always because we've run into a guardian or what IFS calls a protector, some defensive aspect of our psyche or a threat response in trauma language, something that froze in our personality and is now overly rigid and is causing destruction, some kind of negative consequence, and it's preventing something from happening, which would be good. And so understanding your own guardians is key to unblocking and unlocking what lies beneath the guardians, which I will take the position is ultimately goodness, what Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche called basic goodness, the sense of self-regulating, wholeness, dynamic vitality, and emotional resonance. Guardians are a common feature of mythology, serving a guarding function in a hero's journey. This is Cerberus, who guarded the underworld for Hades. And if you think of the underworld as our unconscious, guardians are essentially blocking us from self-knowledge, from deeper knowledge. And the underworld also represents death. The ultimate fear is death. Guardians are a fear-based protective function, ultimately against death, which is the real threat against the ego or the mind. It fears its own dissolution. So the, one of the oldest stories we have is St. George fighting the dragon. And the dragon was getting bigger and more threatening, demanding more and more tribute, first treasure, and then actual human sacrifices and that's what does happen with guardians. They get bigger and bigger. They're energy systems. And then St. George went and slayed the dragon and unlocked the treasure that was tied up in that energy system. The Knights of the Round Table formed a defensive circle. There's something deeply resonant about that. They were the protectors of Camelot. And they each had different skills and different capacities. And together they were able to guard uh, what was valuable in Camelot, the women and children of Camelot, so the vulnerable aspects. And then you can also think of King Herod that effectively tried to kill the divine child, so the old power structure resisted the divine birth. Around temples, there are often guardians, either soldiers or beasts, that protect the goodness that's in the temple. And so maybe it's warding off evil spirits. There's symbolic resonance in having defenders around a sacred place. This is actually my own footage when I was in the Arctic. I got to see musk ox form defensive circles and protect the young and vulnerable, a demonstration of something that is throughout nature. We have defensive structures that protect softer elements. The idea of the guardian of the threshold was picked up by Rudolf Steiner in Theosophy. In 1875, he wrote a play called The Guardian of the Threshold. He was drawing in a novel by the English mystic Edward Bulwer Lytton. The threshold dweller, the person that guards access to sacred places, special places, new worlds. The guardian represents the archetype of the resistance to change. So essentially, the hero is forced with something that will allow them to grow and unlock treasure. And in order to do that, they have to face some aspect ultimately of themselves. In Star Wars, Luke goes into the cave and he has to face himself so that you could think of as the guardian of the threshold. The obstacle a hero must surmount or turn into an ally to reach the treasure. So that's one of the ways past the guardian of the threshold is to turn the guardian into an ally. And that is the pathway that we are interested in because these are parts of ourself. We can't destroy them. It's better to work with them and find a way to cooperate. The Guardian presents a test to see if the hero is ready for more knowledge or access to the special world. And psychologically, we can think of the Guardian as a type of immune system or a defensive function that protects the more vulnerable aspects. It effectively keeps out intruders and ideas and other people that might not have the best intentions for you. And so when you enter a healing container, when you work with a therapist, when you're at a retreat, you're assessing, is this container good enough? Should I rightly reject the knowledge that I'm being presented? Is this helpful or not? So we need to have an immune system. 
And the problem is that this immune system can become overactive and can become an autoimmune disorder where it's preventing the thing that you want. Then the question is, are the shadow aspects of the healing container worse than the problems that I have on my own? And if they're not, then the healing container may be useful to tune your own immune system. So an important aspect of my approach is this multiplicity of self. We all contain multitudes. And the question is not who am I, it's who are I. And then that opens up a lot of space because you don't have to be as hard on yourself. If it's just a part and there are other parts, it starts to give you leverage. And then it's not just the way I am. It's the way a part of me is. But just opening up to that concept can open up a lot in development. The movie Inside Out famously portrayed aspects of the psyche. There was an inner world where the different emotional systems were represented by characters. That's one way of representing parts. And there was a part that represented sadness or loss, fear, anger, happiness. And they had to find a way to cooperate to achieve the goals of the self or the child in the movie. You can also go back to alchemy and atomism when early Western thinkers conceptualized the universe as deriving from creative sparks, the divine being left traces of itself. And these are sparks and the sparks as they cooled formed crust. And the crust is the matter that we see. And the crust is essentially a crystallization of the energy that's at the core. And the alchemists were interested in melting down the crust to gather the sparks and to allow matter to become what it wanted to ultimately become, turning lead into gold. And so that was a concrete way of doing that, but they were ultimately working with a psychological truth. Many psychology models have a similar defensive structure and then deeper aspects. Winnicott used the idea of the false self versus the true self. The false self, in his words, was to protect the true self. We needed a false self when our true self couldn't be received by others, we had to guard it. And so there's this defensive self that we all have to construct in social relations. Jung called it the persona versus the soul. Persona is the mask. Soul is when we go deep within, we don't find nothing. Actually, there's an intelligence system there. We tune into our deeper nature and a wider sense of self, which is our entire being in its widest form. And as we do that, an intelligence emerges, and that Jung referred to as the soul. And then Freud talked about the ego and the superego and the id. The ego, to start with, was the self-image and the organized structure of conscious thought. And the superego is our ideal and our conscience. And those form a way of thinking about the self and operating in the world that isn't all of us, it's a surface layer of us. And then under that, Freud conceptualized the id or the primal needs and wants. And in the Freudian perspective, it's a kind of untrustable seething pit of serpents. But in the Jungian perspective, it's more of a spiritual or mythological center that holds value and meaning and treasure if we can unlock it. In trauma, you can think of the defensive ring as our threat responses. When we're in danger, the ways that we shortcut to safety and all the strategies that we've developed over time to do that. And then in the center, you might think of when we're regulated and we have the full range of responses, what is the creative, authentic potential that emerges? And then more basically, you can just think of it as thinking and feeling. The defensive structure tends to be thinking. More basically, you can think of thinking and feeling that guardians tend to have a bias toward thinking and thinking that is not fully connected to the nervous system. And then when we're connected to our emotional core and we have feeling, that gives a depth and a resonance and then we're below the defensive structure. This is an important point when working with guardians. Fear is not the problem. Not feeling fear is the problem. Our basic move is always to approach feeling, approach the deeper aspects and as we do this more and more, they become more and more approachable and fear is not actually a problem. Fear is just energy or blocked excitement. And when we accept our fear and we really drop into it and inhabit it, it is able to spread and move throughout the body and it becomes our vitality, becomes our sense of aliveness. So fear is not a problem. It's when we are running from fear that it is a problem. 
The guardians crystallize at overwhelming times when we're in adversity. We come up with strategies to deal with that adversity. And the most common one is that our parents have their own protectors and their protectors can inflict harm on us and damage us. For instance, a parent's anxiety. And so we often mirror that protector or guardian that the parent has and end up forming the same structure in order to protect ourselves from their structure and because we see it modeled. And so parents fighting is a classic. Youngest sibling is always a stress on the older sibling. School bullying is basically universal. We all come out of harsh peer environments when we're younger. Most teenagers are in defensive personalities. So there's a lot of guardian behavior when we're younger. And so we have to defend ourselves against that. It's a little bit like Lord of the Flies, where we have to become tough, become mean in order to survive and not be injured or excluded. And then leaving home, separating from your parents, separating from your caregiver, that is a major trauma that we all undergo. And in order to do that, we have to take on aspects of our own support and our own defense that were handled by our parents. As we talk about maps here, it's important to talk about two aspects, understanding and practice. We're firmly in the understanding realm here, and we're mapping, we're identifying aspects of ourselves, categorizing, and that's part of healing. Insight shows us where the battle is to be fought, but then we need to fight the battle. And fighting the battle is showing up and practicing and being kind to ourselves and stopping thoughts that we know are catastrophizing or negative and doing the cultivating behaviors that help us, such as mindfulness. And then when we do these together, then there's an interaction. Practice supports understanding and understanding supports practice because we know why we're practicing. We have a map. So we know where we're going and then we actually have to hike the distance. So Dan Siegel talks about top-down and bottom-up processing. And this actually happens in the prefrontal cortex there are basically layers in the cortex and information comes up from our senses and then information comes down from our mental maps of the world. And where they meet, there's a negotiation. Both influence each other. So our mental maps influence what we see in the world and what we see in the world updates our mental maps. So in top-down processing, we have thinking, mapping. So today that's where we are. Boundary work, understanding where you end and being able to enforce boundaries and then cultivating practices such as mindfulness, breathing, movement, and they're done in an intentional way in order to achieve some kind of purpose. Even if that purpose is purposelessness, you're still doing it intentionally. We'll all be in the category of top down. So another way of thinking of this is intentional. Most somatic sessions, if you work one-on-one, -on -one, are in this realm of bottom-up, which is experiencing or appreciating what is without intention. And so here we are simply opening ourselves to emotions, dynamics that are happening relationally, and parts of ourselves that come forward that represent trauma and traumatic patterning. And another Part of bottom-up processing is the inner healer aspect, self-resonance, getting into a deeply feeling state. And that helps to reorganize our nervous system, helps to update our mental maps, and is a missing component in many lives and in our education system. We have a top-down bias in the West. And so working bottom-up helps you to incorporate information that's not part of your system basically grow. Most growth comes from bottom-up processes. Our goal is to make the simplest map possible using the Einstein idea. And this graphic is by Christoph Niemann, and it shows a heart which is unnecessarily complex and one that's a pixel that you wouldn't necessarily identify as a heart. And so we kind of settled on this very common symbol of the heart and that then becomes useful to us. We can communicate with us. So the same with our maps. We don't need to be overly complex, just simple enough to get a handle on things. And we have to be careful about mapping because our protectors may choose to use mapping as a way of avoiding practice. So we just want to do enough mapping to practice, enough understanding to get started. And we can continue to update the map as we go. So... Here are two kind of 
options. One is where you delineate out all the different guardians and the goodness in the center. You might have different aspects of goodness. Or you can think of one guardian uh, that has many qualities and one emotional core in the center. And it somewhat comes down to personality style. You may have a tendency to, in Darwin's terms, he called the left side splitting and the right side lumping. Splitters tend to emphasize differences. Lumpers tend to emphasize similarities. So lumpers create systems with few categories. Splitters create finely delineated systems. So whatever your tendency is, I suggest you work to do the opposite. So if your tendency is to over-elaborate, keep it simple. And if you tend to keep things too simple, maybe a little bit more elaboration might be useful. Um, and the idea is that part of your way of mapping is likely a protector. And if you have a tendency in one direction, we can use that as a way to adjust the protector that's at work there. Here's our kind of basic map of maps. You're going to make your own map, but this is just demonstration of all the different protective aspects or guardians that are surrounding our emotional core all the strategies we have to keep safe. And there'll be a separate video that goes into a lot of these aspects or the different guardians. For now, you can just think of them as parts of yourself that try to get you to safety. The outer ring there represents our self-resonance. When we drop into deeper embodiment, we're able to take in the whole system and we're no longer looking through the eyes of a protector or in the whole system. Or the self. What are guardians? There are two kinds of guardians. There are guardians that prevent pain, preventers, and IFS they're called managers. And there are guardians that get you out of trouble, out of the core when you've been triggered. And we'll call those soothers. IFS calls those firefighters. So on the preventer side, there's the pressurer. These are just some examples taskmaster, busybody, inner critic, people pleaser, compulsive caregiver, performer, perfectionist, OCD compulsions. OCD is a classic preventer, intellectualizer, dreamer, etc. And on the soother side, we have blankness or dissociation, withdrawal, avoidance, self-sabotage, substance use, emotional eating, sexual acting out or masturbation, media or video game binging, Netflixing, reactivity in relationship, extreme and violent sports, etc. Usually we identify with preventers and dislike our soothers. So preventers are more commonly what we call syntonic or allied with the ego. And so those tend to be dystonic or qualities of ourselves that we find hard to accept. How to spot a preventer. So a teacher of mine, Dave Berger, came up with this word postureitude, combination of posture and attitude, signifying the intent behind a posture. Leaning forward and hunched is typical, often over a laptop. Microtension, especially around the defensive structure of the head and neck, which is how we detect danger. So our eyes, jaw, and neck are a common place where we experience tension and where there's a bracing pattern that underlies this preventer personality. Bracing, crossing our limbs, loss of awareness of body and environment. So we lose the sense that we're hungry or thirsty or in discomfort. If someone sits in the exact same position for 45 minutes without moving once, they're generally in a preventer. And when we're in a preventer, we get tunnel vision and we miss cues from other people and from the environment. And so we miss this changing dynamics around us. Shallow breathing is another classic preventer behavior. And then tensing throughout the body accumulates and compounds usually we're not conscious of it as it's happening but later we notice when it becomes a problem when it crystallizes into a symptom 
tension. The verb tensing becomes a noun, tension, and then we become aware of the noun. So a lot of somatic experiencing is getting to the start of the process and starting to notice the verb, and the verb is where we can change before it crystallizes into a noun. There's a speed to preventers. If we're moving above a certain speed, there's just no way for the body to keep up. The neural pathways throughout the body are unmyelinated, so they're up to 30 times slower. And a thought can be 300 to 500 milliseconds, whereas a signal from the body may take five to seven seconds. So if we're racing too fast, it's like a cog that's spinning that can't connect to the slower cog that's coming from the body. We just spin disconnected from our body. And so if we're moving at a certain speed, we may be making a lot of ground in certain ways, but we are often missing deeper aspects of our own intelligence. And then maybe the best way to spot a preventer is lots of thinking. Thinking that is excessive, fear-based, negative, catastrophizing, doubting, distrusting, competitive, scarcity-minded, scheming, manipulative, overly concrete, or collapsed. We have a sense of danger and we can't feel into a sense of safety. And so we use thinking in a way that is alienated. How to spot a soother. Primal, our deeper needs, sexuality, food, aggression, we don't like it, we experience shame, and we know that other people won't like it, so we hide it. Usually, soothers cause a lot of damage, and they're risky, and often use a lot of our budget. And we might think that we have them under control, but every so often they escape our control, and they really are more powerful than our preventers. So soothers are very powerful parts of the system. And our preventers really don't like the soothers. And so the preventers are trying to remove the soothers often or disown them, and the soothers rebel against the preventers. So we're going to look at a few examples of triangles that happen. And in IFS, they're called polarizations. Often we have a few protectors that are locking each other in place. So we'll go through a couple of examples here. The people pleaser, very common protector, conceals our authenticity and burns out energy. It takes a lot of energy to people please, efforting. We're tired from that and we feel blocked or unvoiced. Our authenticity is not being heard or received. And so then that creates a need to be felt and to express authenticity. And so we need to escape our identity, escape our social role through substance, gaming, whatever we can find, an alternate world where we can be more authentic. But then often that's not accepted in many ways or it has some shame attached to it and there's a disintegration and then we have to hide that and that brings in the people pleaser even more to hide this behavior that we're escaping through. The triangle of shame in a critic is a very common preventer. It attacks us as well as others. And it sees our vulnerable aspects as weak and it impinges us and our emotional core is damaged by it. And so we need relief from that. We need soothing. And so we often have self-sabotage behaviors, putting out the fire. And carbohydrates is a classic way of providing your system with serotonin and soothing emotional distress. But drugs, sex, any activity that can become compulsive or pressured and it's always there for a reason. It's there because there's some kind of preventer that's causing pain in our system. And then we're needing relief. And the critic shames and criticizes the sabotage behavior, doesn't like it. And then the self-saboteur rebels against the suppression by the critic and rebels against parents and against social criticism. The triangle of repressed bigness we start with a straitjacket, which prevents us from being too much or taking up space, keeps us very tightly constrained. And that is a pressure on our emotional core. We feel constricted by it. And then we have unvoiced pain. And in this triangle, I've used the resenter 
which is a behavior of projection where we look at others as objects we can project our pain onto and we can cut them down to size. And if we're in a straitjacket, we may resent people who are not in a straitjacket. And our straitjacket doesn't like these thoughts that might get us into trouble. And so it hides what we're up to even more stifling of the system. The triangle of self-doubt. So the schemer or the ego seeks personal gain at the expense of others and feels guilt. And that crushes the emotional core. And if we go just on the left there, the crushed emotional core makes us alienated and disconnected. And then in that state, our scheming behaviors are amplified because we don't feel safe. And if we continue around on the right there, the crushed emotional core is a dissociation that makes us feel like we don't have self-esteem, we don't have a sense of self, we don't feel ourselves, and that creates imposter syndrome and doubt. So we have the doubter that questions everything, and by doubting and questioning everything, it catastrophizes and amplifies the collapse. So our emotional core collapses even further. Then the schemer tries to overcome doubt with workarounds and schemes, and the doubter doubts what the schemer is up to because it can sense that the schemer is putting it at risk with the group, that the schemes are somehow not well-founded or create risk that they may not be accepted by others. So our doubt is there to protect us from our scheming. And if we have a strong schemer, we have a strong doubter. So how do guardians spread? How do we get our guardians? I've broken down here what Jacques Lacan called the three-part grammar of the drive, which is, and this applies to any kind of verb, any kind of behavior, what you do to yourself, you do to others, was what was done to you. So if you hurt yourself, you hurt others, and you were hurt. Or if you make yourself anxious, you make other people anxious, and you were made anxious by one of your parents or someone. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Whenever you see someone else's guardian that you dislike or that's affecting you, you can think that they're doing that to themselves as well. That can often provide perspective that they no longer appear to be an enemy. There's an emotional core that they have that's being affected by their own guardian that can often help to bring in empathy. So without self-resonance, Guardians inevitably cause what they are trying to prevent. And this is why we work on guardians, because guardians are clumsy, they're overly crystallized, and they end up causing abandonment, loss of health, failure, and pain. Doubling down on a guardian usually just makes these outcomes more likely. Here are some questions to help identify guardians. What gets reflected back to you about your personality? Do you have anything that causes issues that you regard as just the way I am? What don't you like about certain parts of yourself? How are you when you're stressed or tired? What thoughts, feelings, behaviors feel constrictive or less than your full potential? What about you gets in your way or blocks progress? So these are all journal prompts. These are important things to identify. What are your blocks? What is getting in the way? And what prevents deeper intimacy with yourself and others? So guardians cut us off from ourselves, and they cut us off from others. As we're able to feel more, we can connect more with others. So a good way to identify a guardian is what is blocking me from relationship? There's always the question, how do you feel toward the guardian? Because that tells us whether we're in self-resonance or whether we're just in another guardian. So if you feel anything other than resonance toward a guardian, you're in another guardian. So if you feel critical to it, you're in the critic. If you can't accept it, then you're shaming. And if you just go blank and you don't know how you feel, you don't feel a sense of compassion and calm and clarity, then you may be in the blank canvas. And we'll go through all of these in the next video. How to work with guardians. Accept and respect. So guardians are team members. We can't remove parts of the self. Parts of ourselves don't die. They just adapt. So the sooner you 
acknowledge them as team members and start to work with them, the better. And having self-dialogue with the protector, you can ask it questions and then answer from the perspective of the protector and find out what it fears, what it wants, and how old it thinks you are. Unburdening the underlying pain that needed protecting. The heart of the matter, relieving the pressure that drives the protective behavior. And this is the work commonly of therapy, so it can be hard to do by yourself, but it is possible to unburden pain. By experiencing the pain, you're able to let go of it, and it no longer is held or carried by your nervous system. Updating the guardian with how old you are now. So letting your guardian observe you and taking in that you no longer need this younger aspect of yourself to act the way that it is and that it can update and mature. Diffusing to bring in self and somatic resonance. This is a key idea that just by naming it, just by being aware of it and dropping into embodiment as we experience it, we get underneath the guardian. Over time, our guardians become supportive or ideal inner parents, and they become advisors and scouts rather than CEOs. So they're no longer at the driver's wheel, they're supporting our journey, and they have roles to play. We need them. And one of the important things that we're doing is moving from a system that is guardian-led, where we're disconnected to our deeper wisdom and our deeper sense of feeling, to a place where we're self-led, where there's resonance, we're connected, and the whole of us is expressing. If we had harsh parents or we experienced trauma, we have harsh guardians. So aspects of ourselves where we've internalized that harshness and then we terrorize ourselves. The same way that we were terrorized from the outside, we then start to do it from the inside. And so when we're frozen with fear, our system is locked up and we can do that to ourselves. And then we're moving towards supportive guardians. And this is now just to secure attachment but basically our defensive aspects start to become supporters and champions, and they actually can relax the emotional core. So over time, our guardians do become useful and supportive. Nelson Mandela, who was in jail for 27 years, famously befriended his jailer who protected himself for six years, Christo Brand. And Christo described him as being friendly and respectful and really caring about him and asking him questions about his kids and his life. And when Nelson was released, Nelson ended up getting him a job in the new government. And Nelson was 60 years old at the time. He had enough self-resonance, enough of a sense of himself to know that the bigger picture was that this jailer was not the enemy, that there was a systemic issue. And so by befriending the jailer, Nelson Mandela had a better experience in jail. He was able to work with his jailer. So the idea of self-resonance is that we can get a crowbar in under our guardians and then we defuse from them and we experience ourselves more deeply, more broadly. And so self-resonance is a place we can go that allows us to defuse from guardians and unblend. And you can think of it as a part or you can think of it as getting under parts. Then self-resonance. So there's this place that we can get to where we have lightened our perspective and we're in a feeling state where there's clarity, there's inner soil, we're streaming or flowing. There's a sense of curiosity, love, gratitude, awe and wonder, trust and creativity. And self-resonance is something that we can cultivate and we can get more and more until it becomes a stable experience. We talk about islands of safety that grow over time into continents of safety. And more and more of our week, we're in this place where we're flowing and connected and it may be disrupted, but we can get back to it quickly because we're self-regulating. So another very important idea from somatic experiencing is that there's a connection between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic that can get disrupted. And then we are dysregulated. And then our system is not naturally balancing itself or recovering. And so we get stuck on or stuck off. And self-regulation is 
where our system can restore itself back to balance or homeostasis. And when we're in self-regulation, we're dynamic, we adapt to the environment, and we're available to others for intimacy. So in our next video, we'll be looking at what are some of the particular guardians and breaking them down and seeing what the issue is with each of them and how to work with them. Check it out.